My name is Robin Wordsworth. Okay, and what do you do? What are um, you an expert in? I am an expert in planetary climate and climate evolution. Um, and so I work on questions like, why does early Mars have evidence for liquid water? Um, what are the potential climates of exoplanets that we're going to be able to observe in the near future? Okay. And what's the chance that the um, life could have existed on, on other worlds? Okay, well, that's exactly my next question. Are we alone? Are we alone? That is a... <laughs> um, in the sense you obviously mean of um, the um, existence of other life in the uh, outside of Earth. I think for me personally, the only intellectually honest answer I can give to that is that I just don't know. And I think that's an exciting answer because it means that we as scientists have a job to do to, 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 to try to figure out um, whether or not there is life out there. And so it's, uh, I, I think it's easy to have an emotional reaction and to have a like, strong desire for something to be the case one way or the other. But based on my best understanding of the science, it's not possible to say at this point if life on Earth is, is unique or uh, if uh, there is life elsewhere. And of course, the question of alone, I think you also have to define the context. So is life on Earth unique in the solar system or is it unique in the sense that in our stellar neighborhood there are, there are no other earth-like planets or if we go across the entire galaxy would we ever be likely to to to, to find an earth-like world and so um uh, the, the, there are different levels to that question the, the, the fundamental problem is that the, um we are one data point we we are the, we don't have other examples of intelligent life in other situations to compare with and so the, the usual way you proceed with these kind of questions is to do a bunch of experiments, take a bunch of taste, test cases together, and then try to extrapolate from that. But given, given that we're in this unique situation of being uh, life forms that we consider, to, <laughs> we usually consider ourselves as intelligent, and, then, and, and we don't know of other life like us out there. Um, but you said there were one data point. Do you mean we're the only species on Earth who builds radio telescopes? Is that what you mean? Yeah. How, how is your research going to help us find life elsewhere? Uh, so I'm a planetary scientist primarily. I, I like astrobiology a lot and I, I, I work on topics that, that, that overlap into astrobiology, but my core focus is on planetary science and not on the, on the search for life per se. And so I guess I, what I would say to that is that, that as a planetary scientist, I regard the, the, the basic planetary conditions as the building block for understanding um, anything about whether you can uh, sustain or develop life on other worlds and so um, we want to know the, the, the context under which life may or may not develop and um, both in terms of in the solar system trying to understand things like the, the, the evolution of Mars through time where well, Mars and, and Venus and Earth where in paleoclimate it's basically a detective story you have a crime scene of evidence of things that have happened and you have to piece together, together a self-consistent story from that. And then um, on the, the, the other side of what we work on a lot, which is exoplanets, it's operation uh, in theory and modeling, at least in predictive mode right now, where we make um, statements based on generalized models we developed that, that, are, that are based on constraints in the solar system and then, and then try and say for a given exoplanet, what's the probability that it has uh, sustainable liquid water or chemical conditions that are sufficient for life to develop or um, signatures in its atmosphere which may or may not um, convolve with biosignatures or like allow us to, to, to easily detect life or, or, or make that more difficult. What do you think of the usefulness of the Lovelock criterion of an atmosphere and chemical disequilibrium as a biosignature? Yeah, so I think it's one of those great and powerful concepts that's in some ways too powerful because it's such a simple idea and it's it's rightly guided thinking for a long time on this issue, but um, when you really break it down, there, there are multiple ways in which it can, it can diverge or go wrong. And so um, I think it's a great guiding principle, but um, what we've seen in our own research is that there are definitely other ways you can get atmospheres in chemical disequilibrium. Like um, volcanism? Uh, well, most, Pho most obviously. So, okay, so if you take a gas of a given composition and you heat it up enough, then the chemical reaction rates will eventually proceed fast enough that in the time scale that you're interested in, everything will proceed to minimize Gibbs free energy and you'll get, um, 
you'll get uh, thermal chemical equilibrium. And then so Lovelock's essential argument is that systems naturally drive towards equilibrium and life drives away from it. And mm -hmm. so because we're seeing life's waste products in the atmosphere, essentially, that, that allows us to, to make that detection. Um, but then the thing is for any planetary atmosphere, even in the absence of life, you're not dealing with a system in equilibrium. You have um, an atmosphere which is in chemical contact with the, with the interior. You have outgassing and you have exchange with rocks, but sometimes the time scales for that are very long. Um, and then on the other side, you have input of solar energy and UV photons in particular, which, which drive things far out of equilibrium. And so a planet with no life whatsoever, with just UV photons impinging at the top and, and volcanism at the bottom, will ultimately drive out of equilibrium. And so um, the sort of broad love Lockean principle, if you want to put it like that, that, that you, we should look for signs of chemical disequilibrium. It's a great general concept, but it breaks down in detail. And when that breakdown happens, at least so far, uh, the way that the biosignatures debate has had to proceed is that you just model things using models, complex models and, and try and figure out for a given scenario that you've created whether you were to see a biosignature or not. And the, the, that's, that's as good a method as we have right now, but the, the, the issue with it is that you then become dependent on the fidelity of your complex model and the extent to which we're able to imagine all the possible scenarios where you could get life or not. Arthur C. Clarke said that any sufficiently advanced civilization will be indistinguishable from magic. And then there's a guy called Schroeder who says, no, Arthur, you're wrong. Any sufficiently advanced mm -hmm. civilization will be indistinguishable from nature. And there's a two different versions of, of uh, what we imagine advanced civilizations to be like. Do you, what do you think of that? Magic versus nature. Well, it only becomes a, a, a I know the Arthur C. Clarke quote. I haven't um, heard the Schroeder one before. I guess my first reaction to that would be it only it becomes a conflict if you think of magic and nature as things that are separate. And personally, I find nature very magical. So I don't necessarily see a conflict in those two I guess the conflict is a practical one for SETI researchers, whether if, you're, if, if you get a bunch of tree-hugging, happy, nature-compatible aliens, then they won't necessarily make artificial signals. They won't cut down a forest and make a parking lot or something that might be easier to detect. I think yeah. that's the idea of whether you're being a whether civilizations always become more sustainable in a way that makes them more blend in more with the background, I guess. Yeah, very, very difficult question to answer because we don't know. It's not possible for us to conceive as be of beings that are more intelligent than us, so it's very hard to, to think about motivations once you, you pass You can't into conceive of beings more intelligent than we are? I say we as humans. <laughs> okay. I love the way you keep trying to trying to twist back my comments to, to uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> sound is like there's something that they're not. All I mean is that we as humans are, are very bad at thinking outside our, our own okay. societies. Okay, and uh, do you have any advice for students who are thinking about becoming astrobiologists? Uh, just that um, if you have a passion for something, be it astrobiology or anything else, then, then just pursue that. And if, if you're really deeply interested by these deep questions, uh, by kind of profound questions that, that are of this type or and as many others, um, then um, yeah, pursuing curiosity is, is, a, is a wonderful thing. And it, it, you sh should um, feel that you, uh, that, that, that you can do that. And so, um, there's aspects of science which can be tough, like in any profession, and so you, 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 um, I think, I think having the starting point of saying I want to do this because these questions are really cool and really interesting, and I and I just want to pursue them for for that sake. That's that's always got to be the starting point. But then you do have to acknowledge after that that, that a lot of science is hard work and and can be frustrating, and so um, be persistent and don't let other people tell you that that uh, you should not be able to do something or that you should take no for an answer and if you uh, are really into a, to a given area and you want to keep going on it um, just just keep plugging away and, and try to keep the motivations that you had when you when you went into the field because those are always going to be the best ones and um, and as much as possible, try to follow your own path. And uh, I think that if if you're really passionate about it and um, you 
are prepared to work hard, then there's just so many fascinating questions in our field that it's, it's one that's going to require um, many bright people for, for a long time to come.